Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm excited to speak with you about epidemiology and ionizing radiation. I'd like to discuss three issues in interpreting published studies that health professionals, managers, and decision makers should consider. First, some studies are high quality and reliable, and we will describe characteristics of a high quality study. Second, some studies are not of high quality and are not reliable. They shouldn't be incorporated into decision making. Third, some studies are conducted with poor methods, such as with poor or no measures of radiation dose and inadequate statistical analyses. They are so flawed that they cannot be interpreted. Studies of human populations exposed to radiation have become very sophisticated, but many are very difficult to interpret, misleading or overinterpreted, despite being published in high impact journals. For simplicity, we will refer to these three categories as reliable, unreliable, and flawed. In 2018, the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements, or the NCRP, published Commentary 27, supported in part by the CDC, which critically evaluated 29 recent epidemiologic studies as to their strengths, limitations, and usefulness for radiation protection decision makers. In this module, we will discuss what is radiation epidemiology and what have we learned from 100 years of radiation epidemiology research. It would be good to start with some background information. So let's begin with a definition of epidemiology. It is simply the study of the distribution and causes of disease in human populations. It comes from the word epidemics. Epi means upon, and demos means people. So it's the study of what causes disease in people. And radiation epidemiology is simply the study of radiation as the cause of disease in people. I believe that many people are familiar with epidemiology, but in the context of infectious disease epidemiology, which deals with flu, Ebola, and Zika viruses, or in the context of epidemiologic departments that deal with food poisoning and other sources of population disease. Radiation epidemiologists deal primarily with chronic diseases and cancer in particular. These diseases that occur many years after radiation exposure. Because of the wealth of knowledge on the health effects of radiation on people, radiation epidemiology has a huge impact on setting radiation protection standards for workers and public safety. But the plethora of studies with conflicting, if not questionable, results create confusion for decision makers, standard setters, and the public. So how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? What makes a study reliable versus unreliable or simply flawed. Some of the limitations in the unreliable and flawed studies render them uninterpretable and they should not be considered for public policy or risk assessment and management. Epidemiologists, of which I am one, have been studying populations exposed to radiation for over a hundred years. We know about the effects of radiation at high doses especially when such doses are delivered at a high rate. High doses, for example, occur during radiation treatments for cancer. And high dose rates usually refer to exposures that occur in less than a second or perhaps as much as an hour. We have learned how to quantify or estimate the chance that radiation causes specific cancers following specific doses from the many studies conducted since the turn of the last century, the early 1900s. These studies begin 
with the early radiologist who developed skin carcinomas and leukemia, the radium dial painters who developed bone cancer, the Japanese atomic bomb survivors in 1945, the children who were treated for benign conditions such as enlarged tonsils, who later developed thyroid cancer, the underground miners who breathed radon and its decay products and developed lung cancer many years later, the nuclear energy and nuclear weapons workers who are still being studied, the children living near Chernobyl after the accident who drank milk contaminated with radioactive iodine and developed thyroid cancer at a high rate, the cancer survivors who developed second cancers later in life, and even the astronauts who developed cataracts or lens opacities from space flight and space radiation. Recently, new information is coming from worker studies where the exposure was gradual and over a period of years and not brief and at a high rate as in many other studies. Radiation human studies have been ongoing for decades and much knowledge has been gained about acute and long-term health effects of workers and populations that were exposed to considerable amounts of radiation. The radiation human studies continue to this day and are used as the basis for radiation protection standards and for compensation schemes related to claims of ill health among atomic veterans who participated in atmospheric nuclear weapons tests and Department of Energy weapons employees at Manhattan Project facilities such as Oak Ridge, Hanford, and Los Alamos. Despite the decades of research in radiation epidemiology and the vast amount of knowledge currently available there remain many important and unanswered questions. Today, the focus of radiation epidemiologists has turned to not whether radiation causes cancer, but how much cancer is caused by radiation, and does it matter at all whether you're exposed to radiation briefly or chronically? As will be the theme of these discussions, there are many epidemiologic studies out there with conflicting results that create confusion for decision makers, the public, and even scientists. So sound judgment from radiation professionals, managers, and decision makers is needed to protect people without unduly restricting the beneficial effects of radiation, such as in medicine, and in industry, such as non-destructive testing with radioactive sources. So what have we learned from the past century of research? Importantly, the focus on genetic effects, that is, any effects of parental exposures that might result in adverse effects in their children and subsequent generations, has shifted to somatic effects in individuals, for example, cancer there have been large-scale epidemiologic studies of the children of parents who have been exposed to the atomic bombings and of children of cancer survivors who were treated with radiation therapy. No evidence for untoward effects on the children of these exposed parents were found. No increase following preconception exposure to the gonads was seen for a variety of adverse effects, such as malformations, stillbirths, neonatal deaths, cancer, multifactorial diseases, such as diabetes, or biological measures of possible changes in genes transmitted from the parents to the children. Has radiation damage to parents' gonads, testes, or ovaries been passed on to their children? There hasn't been any evidence in humans, although there is evidence in studies of mice. Now we have switched concern to the individual to, what about me? Understandably, we were very concerned about our kids, and it's now about the individual. Here's what else we've learned. You can get exposed once in your life 
and your risk of cancer or your chance of developing a cancer remains for your entire life. And a one-time exposure of sufficient dose is all that's needed. The young are more susceptible to developing cancer following exposure than the old, but there are a few notable exceptions. Another somewhat surprising finding from the study of atomic bomb survivors is that exposure during pregnancy to the fetus or embryo does not carry a greater risk of developing cancer than exposure to a young child under the age of six years. In fact, prenatal exposures may carry a lower cancer risk than exposures after birth to the young child. Women are more susceptible than men, mainly because the breast and the ovaries are highly susceptible to radiation-induced cancer, whereas the testes and prostate are highly insensitive. One cancer site of current interest is the lung, where women, based on the atomic bomb survivor study, appear to have a much higher risk than men following radiation. This is important to NASA in their guidelines for space exploration, and it limits the time women can spend in space. But the evidence is conflicting and based on only one study, albeit of very high quality. Risk of developing cancer later in life, again, the probability that cancer might occur, differs by organ or tissue. The bone marrow is very sensitive and leukemia might develop. The rectum and other tissues are very insensitive and cancer risk rarely, if ever, is elevated following exposure. Perhaps surprisingly, some sites have not been convincingly or consistently linked to radiation exposure. Cancer of the cervix, the prostate, the pancreas, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, malignant melanoma, and Hodgkin's lymphoma, for example, despite 100 years of epidemiologic studies. An interesting biological question is why this might be so.